But uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, in your Bible, we uh, continue in our path. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and uh, he has traveled around, came back. Now he's going back around again and uh, going to different areas. And um, last week and the week before, we talked a little bit about the Macedonian call. And uh, I just personally, uh, just praying today about my life and about this church, just so encouraged by the Macedonian call that God has people who need to hear the gospel and then God calls you to do it and the question is are you going to be obedient to do it or not and that's what Paul he answered the call he answered the call and he went God called he went he began to share the gospel and of course you know uh, Paul throughout the book of Acts as we have learned on these missionary journeys first thing he would do is make a beeline right for the temple he would begin to reason with the scriptures with the Jewish people in the temple and uh, at some point they would get tired of hearing him Uh, at one point it even said they stopped their ears and ran screaming away from him and then they would chase him out of there and then the Gentiles would say hey what about us can you come preach to us and so then he would go outside of the city gates and he would begin to preach to the Gentiles and then they were saved and many were saved and then the Jews would be so upset they would go back and attack Paul and they would you know beat him with rods and they would uh, you know try to stone him and they would do all sorts of things and throw him in prison and throw him in uh, all sorts of uh, do all sorts of things to him but yet what you keep noticing about Paul is he never gives up he never gives up he continues to go and go and go and go, and he, he continues to serve God in spite of the opposition. And so um, we see how he had went through several of the regions tonight. We're going to get to another region that he was in. Uh, he was out in Thessalonica. I think we started in verse uh, 1. I think we got some of it last week, but I'll go back and pick up with Acts 17, verse 1. It says, Now when they had passed through... And Physelus uh, and Apollyona, and they came to Thessalonica, right? And uh, when you read the book of Acts, realize this is history, this is actual places. And then when we read our New Testament, things like Thessalonians, that's exactly where this uh, letter was written to, was this place of Thessalonica. This is the beginning of the church there. Uh, then uh, as, as there was the synagogue of the Jews, then Paul, as the custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And I love how... It always says from the scriptures, right? Uh, For those that follow modern day Christianity and those who teach and uh, preach theology, uh, there's a big movement right now from a mega church pastor that says you have to unhitch Christianity from the Bible. That the Bible um, is a storybook, but it is not something you can use to prove that God exists or that the gospel is true. And so the Bible is a resource and not a source. But, and he quotes people like Paul. Paul did not have a Bible like you and I have. But certainly Paul had scriptures. And certainly Paul had the first five books of the, New, of the Old Testament. He had the prophets. He had some of the writings. And so there was well enough that every time Paul comes, he always reasons from the scriptures. And the scriptures and the word of God attest to themselves. And so they don't need any propping up or they don't need any pushing forward. And if you don't reason from the scriptures, then you have relative truth. And what happens when you get relative truth? What, what is true for you? may not be true for me. What's true for me may not be true for you. So you like your truth and I like my truth. Problem is when your truth begins to be something different than what, uh, you know, what society accepts or what society says is right and then all of a sudden you get into uh, everyone is doing right in their own eyes and no one can judge anyone and the Bible can't judge and so when we push away from scriptures we're really uh, leaning out into troubled waters and so um, I pray that this, uh, this leader um, recants from what he says, but it doesn't look like he's going to. Um, he is on a path, and so he has a large following, and there's a lot of people following down that road. And I hope that the fruit from this theology um, doesn't uh, end up uh, bankrupting or shipwrecking a lot of people's faith. Because without the scriptures, without understanding the perspective of the Bible... Um, it, it's it, it, Christianity without that is impossible. So um, he, he, Paul knew this. He began with scriptures. He reasoned with them. Verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ uh, had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. So interesting that we had just went through Easter 
And uh, I said this before, that the American church um, really gets so excited about the incarnation, about Christmas. Uh, these New Testament believers, they were far more excited about Easter than they were Christmas. They were excited about the resurrection. They were excited about this, uh, fe- this, this, this birth of, of Christ, not only just the birth of Christ, but him dying and him was resurrected. And he's saying, this is the day I'm demonstrating you that he was this person. He was the Christ. And this Jesus I preach to you is the Christ. Christ means the anointed one. So they were always looking to Christ. That's the anointed one. That would have been the heavenly title. Jesus was his earthly title. So put the earthly title of Jesus to the heavenly title of the anointed one. And that's who we have. Jesus of Nazareth, the anointed one of God. Fully God or truly God and truly man dwelling in one being. And he said, this is the one I told you about that suffered and he died, and he was resurrected, that's the one I want to point you to. Let me tell you, any type of preaching you do, or any type of witnessing that you do, if it doesn't point people to Jesus, there's a problem with it, all right? Because that's the purpose of it. The purpose is to point people to Christ. It's not how great I am, it's how great he is, right? And so, when you're listening to the sermons, or you're listening to theology, or you're listening to um, just any type of, of Christianity, If it's not pointing you to Jesus, then you ought to have a really serious red flag go up and think, hmm, what is this pointing to? If it's pointing to an emotion, if it's pointing to a a philosophy, if it's pointing to some sort of tradition or religion, then a red flag should go up because the gospel always points to Jesus Christ. That's the way you could tell a false teacher or you could tell someone who is not uh, teaching a true gospel is it doesn't point to Christ. And so Paul points to Christ. We should point to Christ. Then verse 4, and some of them were persuaded. Now that gives me hope too because I told you guys this before when I first became a pastor I thought I was going to be Billy Graham. You know what I mean? And I would uh, share the gospel and People just walk the aisles and everyone would respond and everyone would get saved. But we know that's not the truth, right? We know that people have the choice to be able to reject God, to reject the gospel. But some of them are persuaded and those are the ones to rejoice over. And and Sunday, those five baptisms, I mean, what a wonderful time for us to rejoice that they were pointing, that they were persuaded of this Jesus the Christ and that's what Paul is saying that as he preached this they were some of them who were persuaded and I know sometimes it feels like you minister and you share and you people don't listen and people don't come to Christ and people don't uh, you know listen to the word but there are some there are some and that's what makes it worth it and Paul has focused on those who were not those who were not he, he left those behind, but then those who were persuaded, not only just the Jews, but then a great multitude of devout Greeks. I don't think I've done a great job of explaining Greeks to you. Greeks to you to, to this time and throughout this culture, um, they consider them second class citizens, right? So the Jewish tradition and the Jewish belief system were they were the elect of God. And if you were outside of that nationality, if you were outside of those who was not fall under the nation of, of, of Israel, then you were a Gentile. Another word is Greek, or many times they would call them dogs. They wouldn't even call them human beings. They would look and say, they're outside of the covenant of God. Only we are the elect. And so here, now we see the gospel, and we see this transition happening in the book of Acts, that the gospel began in Jerusalem, but then it went to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so now when Paul is sharing the gospel, the majority of the people getting saved now are not nationality of the Jewish nationality, but they are of Greeks, they are Romans, they are of those of the whole area, of those who were um, not of the faith, and so these were those who were devout Greeks as well, and not, and then, uh, and then as well, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas, and so you can see this gospel, it's going, it's producing fruit, Paul is working, and he is also preaching, he's reasoning in the synagogue, 
uh, but verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, become, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city up in uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. Here they come, right? They were upset again with Paul. They began to uh, gather up a group of people, and they took evil people from all over the places. Isn't it amazing how you can't get evil people to get along with one another, but when it comes to something against Christianity or Christ, how they unite so well together? You know what I mean? It's like, you, you people are evil, and you can't even get along. You hate each other, but there's a greater hatred for the things of God than they have a hate for one another. And they group up, and they come together, and they get a mob because they were envious, because they were upset, and they were not persuaded. And so what do they do? They attacked. They attacked the house of Jason. They attacked uh, Paul. They attacked all those around there. Verse 6, but when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here to you. Now, to me, that's a compliment, right? I think about this, this little religion, supposedly, that's starting on this uh, obscure part and uh, beginning to grow. Now they're saying that this is actually turning the world upside down, right? I love what Dr. Vine said at First Baptist when you read this verse. He said, the Christians didn't turn the world upside down, they turned it right side up, right? <laughs> because the world's already upside down, and the gospel turns our world right side up. But in other words, it was, it was having an impact, it was having a movement, and the work of God had begun to change and begin to, to cultivate and begin to uh, impact people. And they became concerned. They became stirred up. And they hated it. And they couldn't stand it. And they didn't bring serious charges against them. They just said, they're turning the world upside down. Look at verse 7. Then Jason had harbored them. And these are all the acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. There it is. So they falsely accused them of saying the ruling of Caesar, which says there is no other earthly king other than Caesar. You'd have to bow down to Caesar. They were saying, here this, uh, this belief system now is saying there's another king and it's Jesus. And now because they are proclaiming Jesus, they need to be executed. It is punishable by death if you do not bow down to the earthly king. I know this sounds kind of far-fetched, but it... It seems like the process that you go through these countries and nations that have risen, it gets to a point that one person or one type of uh, thing begins to rule and reign. If you go against that, you pay for it with your life. And that's what Caesar was saying. If you, bow, if you, don't, if you don't bow down to me and you say there's another king, then you're going to die. And that's what they blamed him of. They said, this is, this is what you were doing. Then verse 8, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let him go. So then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So they had to go out the back door again. They were being persecuted and they had come to a point to where they were going to be uh, on trial and they knew something was going to happen and so they sent them out by night. And so off to Berea they go, to another town. Then when they had arrived, arrived through the uh, end of the synagogue of the Jews, verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. You ever heard someone say, be like the Bereans? Or study your Bible like the Bereans, these Berean believers here. Um, this is why they called them, uh, why they have, a, 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 you know, someone uh, says they are greater than those of uh, in Thessalonica. And they have an accolade or they have a, a mantra that these were Bereans who, who were ready to hear God's word. And so, you know, for us, when people say, be like the Bereans, here's what we can be like the Bereans, that they received the word. So, so there's, a, there's a, not only the preaching of the word or the sharing of the word, but there's a receiving of the word. And that means having our ears open and having our hearts open, right? And how did they receive it? With all readiness. They were, they were eager. They wanted to hear a word from the Lord. 
They prayed about it. They studied it. They wanted it. They, they, they yearned for it. They wanted to hear from God. They were ready, and they were constantly asking the Lord to bring this word. And when they heard it, they received it with all readiness or gladness. And you think about our lives when we get to the word of God. How do we receive the word of God? You know, I think for my life, you know, many times as I uh, read the Bible or many times I hear it on the radio, how many times it's just kind of going in the background and my mind is like a, a thousand miles away, you know, and I'm not there with an eagerness ready to hear the word. And a lot of times for me in my life, I don't know about you, but God begins to, to put things in my life to make me stop and slow down and say, wait a minute, you better listen up here, right? I think, you know, my life and throughout blessings and throughout good times, it's almost like God is whispering, you know, but in bad times, it's like he's shouting to me, you know, because it's not that God speaks any differently. It's that I'm listening differently. It's that when things are good and things are well and things are moving in my life, I don't receive the word as well. And so the Bereans were ready. They were ready to hear the word. They were eager to hear the word. And I, just, to, just to think about your life and think about your script, to, to think about the word and how you receive the word with all eagerness, how eager are you to receive the word? I think about how easy it is to sit down and watch a two or three hour movie, right? You ever sit down and read the Bible for two to three hours? I think about how easy it is to get in your car and listen to a few songs on the way to the next stop and not even consider putting on scriptures or listen to the word or receiving something from God. And yet it's, it's not always on the readiness of our heart or eagerness of our mind. Even at church, many times we get here and we may serve or we may have something on our mind or we may just want to get through the things that we're going through and yet we're not eager, eagerly ready to receive the word. There's the, there's the preaching of the word, but there's also the receiving of the word. And here were these Bereans and they were fair-minded, which means they were, they were in a much better condition because they were ready and eager to receive the word. So... How can we practically work this out in our life? One is we, could, we can prepare our hearts for the Word. You know why we sing music before we have the Word of God? It's because music has a way of preparing your heart for God's Word. That's it, just the way it is. And, and in your heart, you begin to sing about God, and you begin to think about God, you begin to open up about God, and then the Word of God comes, and it, it, it shares with you something about God, and it prepares your heart. That's why when you come to church, we don't do performances, right? You don't know, when you notice the difference between our church and some other churches is the, the room's not blacked out. We don't have professional musicians. We don't have a performance for you to sit and just listen. It is something for you to engage in. That all Christians should engage in this worship or engage in singing or preparing your mind and being ready to receive the word with eagerness. That we are waiting for God's word or we want it and we desire it and they prepare themselves. And so they were prepared to receive the word with eagerness. And then they search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. I think for us, as many times as Christians, it's very challenging because when you talk to lost people, they ask you questions that you might not know about the Bible, right? And, and things you know about the Bible sometimes is not as much as you should know about the Bible, right? And uh, I was convicted of this many, many years ago because, you know, in my life, I'd always played sports and I always loved sports. And you know how easy it is for me to tell you who won the national title in this year and that year and who played quarterback and who played running back, and who did this and who did that? But then let me tell you what the 66 books of the Bible is and watch me stumble through them, right? I, or, or to talk about all, all these different scriptures I can memorize and stats and memorize, uh, you know, strategies and memorize all these things about sports or even old country songs. You know what I mean? The songs that you never forget that seem to be etched in your mind or whatever songs you may sing or whatever movie you might have watched or it seems to be just etched in your mind and you remember them. But yet when it comes to the Word of God... You're not as serious about searching those things or looking to those things or being eager about getting into those things. The Bereans were ready. They received it, but they also searched the scriptures. They were people of the book. 
You know, for me as a pastor, I'd like to be known as a pastor of the book, right? For us as a church, I would like to be known as a church of the book, church of the Bible, right? That we, we were those who study God's word and not just one time a week, but daily. Because what person could survive off of one meal a week? Certainly not me, right? So maybe you can, but certainly not me. But you'd say that's unhealthy. You won't grow. You're not going to have the strength. You're not going to have the power. You're not going to have the ability to do things that you need to do. Well, think about the scriptures. If you only eat one time a week when you come hear a sermon, how strong you think you're going to be. Not very strong, but if you get into God's word daily, that means every day trying to search the scriptures and learn about God and just read his word and to study it and to go back and find out whether these things are true or not. That's why it's important, you know, when I preach from the Bible that I tell you to, that I can't preach from the New King James Version, for you to get a Bible, for you to mark your Bible, to put your Bible, to make notes in your Bible, to, to, to mark it on your phone or put a highlight because you need to go back to them not just one time but daily and to find out is what I'm saying true, is what the Word of God says, is what Paul was saying was true. And so they searched the Scriptures with eagerness, and they received the Word of God with readiness, all readiness. I love that part about the Bereans. And what happens? Look at verse 12. Therefore many of them believed. And also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So they all believed. It was fruitful. But when the Jews from Thessalonica heard that the word of God was preached by Paul to Berea, they came also there and stirred up the crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, uh, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. And so those who conducted Paul uh, brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So they were on the run again. Where did they run to? Look at verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Now, we read the Bible, you realize that what drives people and what is actually the motivation for those prophets or for those who share the gospel, even Paul, who was a great missionary, um, there's an internal calling in our life that is greater than anything external. And so what Paul was seeing is this whole town or this whole city of Athens was turned over to idols. They were worshiping all, all sorts of gods and, and many gods. There was a God for everything. And, and what happened to Paul when he noticed that and he saw that, his spirit was provoked in him. That means Paul said, that I'm, not, I'm not good with that, right? Like that, that stirs my soul, that provokes me. And what happened, what stirs inside of Paul, uh, moves his heart on, the, uh, moves his life on the outside. And I love this because this is all the part of the calling of Paul in his life, and the calling of Paul that he has in his community, and Paul, uh, calling that Paul has with those who are around him. And this is much sim- uh, This is very similar to the call that we see with Nehemiah, as we studied Nehemiah several years ago. You remember that. All those had come back from Jerusalem, and they said, it's terrible, it's beaten down, the walls have been broken, and the, you know, the, the city has been, is going to be burned, and it's in shambles. And it says that Nehemiah sat down, and he wept, and his heart was broke, and his spirit was moved inside of him that he must do something about it. He didn't know what he could do, but he said he was willing for God to use him in any way he could to make a difference in that in Jerusalem same with Paul he he didn't just sit his spirit was provoked and it was provoked because they had given themselves over to idols and you really boil this down to we see this in Jesus life as well it comes down to compassion you know having empathy for someone or sympathy for someone is just feeling sorry for them having compassion for something someone or something means not only do you feel it for them, but you're, you're, you want to do something about it. You are moved to do something about it. And the same word here, provoked, it doesn't just mean a, a mental ascent of being sorry. It goes further than that. 
that he was sorry, but he was going to do something about it because he saw the city was given over to idols and he knew the path they were on and it broke his heart. He was moved with compassion like Jesus when he came into Jerusalem as we were studying the descent of the last time Jesus came into Jerusalem. You would think Jesus knew he was going to go there to be betrayed, to be crucified, to die on a cross. And yet, when he got uh, through the valley and looked up through Jerusalem, he looked over and he said, I, I weep because they are like sheep without a shepherd. That's compassion. That's moved with compassion. In our life, many times, why we don't share Christ is because we don't, we don't have a lot of compassion for people. You know, I think in our culture today we desensitize ourselves from humanity right and uh, I think it's important for us to think about this because uh, this is something that impacts our culture is that people have has is so desensitized from desensitized from reality that what is on social media is more real to them than actual reality in their life and so they, they, they live their life in a world that doesn't exist. They live a life in a world that they can, they can be a part of whoever they want to be and do whatever they want to do. And, and they're not really tied to any reality or any human being. And so through that process, you could become very hateful. You could become very angry. You could become something that, you know, that you can, you can hate people you never even met before. And you become cold and you become calloused. And then when you do meet someone in reality, your heart is still the same and you have no compassion for them. You don't care for them. You don't have any, any sort of movement in your heart for them, no love for them. And, and, and in our society as well, I think many times we get and we look and we listen to the news and we listen to social media and we listen to people talk and we get to a point where I don't even like this person or I can't stand this person or I hate these type of people. And in all reality, we've never even met them before. We've never even had anything to do with reality in their life. But I can promise you, if you want your heart to be moved, start talking to people and investing in people's lives and you, won't, you can't help be, but be moved with compassion for them. When you start seeing their life and you start seeing what's happened in their life and you start having compassion for people and just like Paul, he loved people. He wanted them to come know Christ, but he saw this whole city. They were given over to idols and he was moved or he was provoked in his heart. Then I would ask for us in our world today, our, how much compassion do you have for people without Jesus Christ? I think it's easy to throw out the titles, it's easy to throw out the names, it's easy to, to, to throw out all those things, but seriously, how, how much compassion do we have to, to try to share the gospel with them, to try to point them to Christ, to have some sort of love for them in your heart for them, and, and yet Paul never lost that compassion, that was part of his calling. And I think in our life, when we lose that compassion, we, we begin to lose our mission in life. It's much like when you're married or much like when you have a relationship for any length of time, the longer you go, if you're not careful, the passion and the, and, and, and the love for one another will begin to fade away rather than getting stronger. And if you don't work at it, you don't, you don't put time into it, you don't invest in it, next thing you know, you, you're with the person for a long period of time and the one you're supposed to love the most, you end up loving the least because you have no care, you have no compassion for them because you didn't keep your heart pure and you didn't keep your heart full of compassion for him same with us with the lost we ought to look to the world and see lost people and we should be moved with compassion and that compassion should move us to the mission the mission of sharing christ and paul was always moved by the internal he was always moved by his calling always moved by his compassion he saw them they were given over to idols look at verse 17 therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews, he said, well, I'm going to do it again, right? He went to the Jews' synagogue. He went to the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily for those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? I don't know what really the word babbler means there, but it doesn't sound very endearing, right? Probably not something you should call your wife or your daughter. They're babblers, right? But anyhow, they're like, here's, here's this babbler, right? What is this guy who's talking this crazy? What does this babbler want to say? And others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, 
because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. They knew they had nothing, they knew nothing about this Jesus. They knew nothing about the resurrection. So they said he was a babbler. He was preaching this former uh, this foreign God. Then we look at verse 19, and they look at, they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of you speak, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore we, do not, uh, therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So they wanted to hear it. They were all about wanting to know what it was. They were telling Paul, what is this crazy stuff you're talking about? Who is this Jesus? What is this resurrection? Then Paul stood in the midst of Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. So he's like, you got that part down. You are religious. You want to seek something outside of yourself. But you, that's all it is. You're religious. And for I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. So they had altars listed and they had known gods. And they had all the known gods. And they had hundreds of gods they were worshiping. And all sorts of different kinds of worship. But then he said, I even found this altar with the inscription to the unknown God. So so they were all worshiping their own God, and then they even put one to the unknown God. He said, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands, though he needed us anything since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries that are dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that he might grant uh, that he might grope from, for, for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. And also some of you uh, of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man uh, whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to, to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others had said, we, w we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Diocinus and Arapagate and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. So Paul's sermon, he preached to them, right? Where did Paul begin with? To this unknown God. You know what that means? Everyone searching for God in religion will not find him there, right? When I say religion, I mean the world's attempt to reach God. You know why? Because religion can't reach God, right? The world cannot reach God. It never happens. And so even in the midst of this very religious and very dedicated and for those who are worshiping all sorts of idols, I mean hundreds of idols, they were still empty. They were so empty that they said there is an unknown God out there because they knew their hearts was not fulfilled. They knew their hearts were yearning. They knew their hearts uh, did not know uh, the one and true God. And so they said, yeah, let's go ahead and just make an altar to the unknown God. So Paul says, I know that unknown God, that unknown God that you have written that, uh, that, that altar to. He said, I want to proclaim him to you. And I love, I love this because where does Paul start? Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it. Huh? Does that not go back to Romans chapter 1? Romans chapter 1 goes back to the very beginning, and it says that for those who uh, had, had rejected God, rejected God not because they didn't know God, but they, because they chose not to know God, right? Throughout creation, uh, it has witnessed to all people that there is a God, and that because of the creation, the logical conclusion is a creator. 
And he begins with that. And he says, that God who made everything and in it, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the one. He's the one who you're looking for. He's the one. And as they look to the stars and they look to the things, and I don't know what it is about man, but through religion and through other processes, you know, they begin to worship the creature rather than the creator, right? I don't know about you, but in the world today, there's more people who worship the creation than they do worship the creator, right? And yet he comes and he says, no, it's not about the creation. It's about the creator. And, and you know what's undeniable is the, the understanding of who made the world. And I love, I talked a little bit about this several weeks ago. When we talk about creation, when we talk about the beginning of the earth, and we talk about all that there is, and where did we come from? You know, you have all these different opinions, and we had all these theories. When I was growing up, they were 100% sure that, you know, that the Big Bang Theory was true. And evolution was true because they found a, a tooth in the middle of Arkansas. You guys remember that? I remember I was coming through there. My science teacher was so happy. They found this tooth in Arkansas. It dated back to carbon dating or carbon rating or where they said for like seven and a half million years old. Well, just five years later, they found out that it was a hog's tooth from the farm next door. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> they were so sure. But yet, science continues to prove that there is a creator, right? That, that this stuff, didn't, even the basic biology, when you break down the cells, that in your cells, if you take anything out of a living cell, it cannot survive any less than what's already in our life. So that means if you, de if you deduct this down throughout, uh, throughout evolution and throughout the process of what they, what they said we come from and all these other things, it's, not, it's scientifically proven it can't happen that way. And just like one uh, writer said, if there's a watch in a room, the logical conclusion is there was a watchmaker who made that watch, right? That's the logical conclusion. And when people see creation the logical conclusion of their heart and in their mind and in of their, in of their conscience is there is a creator. That's why the Bible says the fool has said in their heart there is no God. Because it's not an intellectual thing. It's you coming to a point that you're saying that I know the facts but I choose not to believe them anyways. And so that's what he's saying, that this God is undeniable because you have seen him in creation. He's made the heavens and he made all these earth and he is the one you should turn to. And through his life, he's made everything with has breath and all things. And he is to be worshipped and he, is, he has determined these things. In verse 27, they should seek the Lord in the hope that he might grope for him and find him and, that he, might, and he, that he is not far from each one of us. In him we live and move and have our being and also some of our own poets have even said, for we have also his offspring. So he just takes them right to the beginning of the things and he's saying, listen, it's not about all these things that you're going after. It's not about all these. It is God and himself. He is the creator of all things. And so he begins with this, and they mocked him. But some believed, and some mocked. Let's get to, verse, let's get to chapter 18 real quick. So then we're going to come to Corinth. So after these things, Paul departed from Athens to Corinth. What letter in the New Testament do you know about that might be written to Corinth, right? Corinthians, right? we got 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And there he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, and he who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. There he is, right back to pointing to Jesus. Verse 6, but when they had opposed him and blasphemed him, uh, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Uh, he said, I'm tired of it, shakes it off. I'm going to go straight to the Gentiles. And he departed from there entered a hurt certain man uh, named Justice, uh, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Oh, uh, as, you, as you think about this and you think about Paul and his persistence, I think sometimes in our life we pale in comparison, right? 
we get a little opposition, somebody makes uh, fun of us, and somebody, you know, persecutes us a little bit, and we kind of shrink back from witnessing. We don't want to tell people we know God. We don't want to speak up at the office. We don't want to speak up at school. But man, look at Paul. Paul persevered. He persevered through it all, and he kept going, and he kept sharing Christ. And all he did was keep pointing people to Christ over and over and over. And that's why, as we look to this in these stories and acts, that's why it's so important for us to, to get the heart of Paul, have this compassion for people, to have the perseverance to keep going, even through the midst of any heartache and pain. He kept going, and he was compelled by the Spirit time and time again to keep um, going through those things. And it's just amazing how you read his story. And I pray tonight as we consider this, and we'll, we'll end there with that verse, uh, talking about Corinth, because I don't want to get to the next section, but we'll get to it next week. But um, as we think about this in our lives, you know, how, how much compassion do we have for people? And how, how much are we committed to sharing God and sharing Christ with those who are around us? And, and to see Paul persevering through these things, and how many things do we come to that is really nothing compared to what Paul was going through? And Paul persevered. If he's persevering, we can, we can continue to persevere as well. And so I'm going to pray, then we'll take uh, questions and talk about these verses a little bit, and maybe something in verse chapter 17 as well, if you got any questions about that. But let's pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to our prayer time at the end as well. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I do pray as we consider these verses, as we continue to uh, study your word. I pray, Lord, as we think about these, as we meditate on them, Lord. I pray that our hearts will be moved. I pray that we will have compassion. I pray, God, that we will be like the Bereans, and we will be eager to hear your word. We'll be eager to search the scriptures and to know more about you, God. We will set aside the things that distract us and pull us away, but, Lord, we'll focus, and we will try to um, just tune our hearts to yours so we can hear your word in our life, Lord. And I pray, God, that we'll never get over the message of Jesus Christ in our life, Lord. Just as Paul had a radical transformation, he knew what God had done for him. He simply wanted to tell others uh, that what God could do for them. And I pray, Lord, as we go through our life, that we, as we meet and we come in contact with people, that we'll have that same heart and that same desire. Not to point people to religion, not to point people to uh, better ourselves, but point them to Jesus. Point them to the one who can change.